when a sandal isn't just a sandal. Next on One Gospel's One Idea. Okay, here we go. So let's talk about Jesus' instructions to his 12 apostles before sending them out for the first time. Some people don't know that actually his apostles, while he was still alive, um, actually went on two different missionary journeys. This is the first one. Now, Jesus had recently chosen 12 disciples to be called apostles. That just means they're delegates sent on his behalf, so he sent them out. Very recently, he had performed many miracles and taught in their midst, but now he's sending them out on their own. So what's the context of this? John the Baptist is in prison, but still alive. Jesus had just given the apostles authority to heal the sick and exercise demons. They were to go to Israelites only, telling them that the kingdom of God was near. And he gives them a lot of specific instructions about how to conduct themselves, including what to bring with them. He commanded them that they should take nothing for the journey except one staff. Acquire neither gold nor silver nor copper in your money belts, nor leather sack, but wear sandals and do not put on two tunics each, nor sandals, nor staffs, nor bread, for the laborer is worthy of his food. Okay, you see a lot of colors there, don't you, Holly? So um, that's because this is taken from three different Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, And so the different colors correspond with different combinations of one, two, or three of these Gospels having um, the same information. So putting it together into sort of a coherent paragraph, is that's what we call challenge number one. But of course, when you actually look at the details, you might get confused. Mark's instructions... So that's like the dark yellow is marked by itself. It says, wear sandals and use a staff. That sounds normal, except Matthew, which is blue, says, don't bring sandals for the journey. Matthew and Luke, which is purple, say not to bring staffs. So Mark says, bring a staff. Matthew and Luke say, don't. Matthew says, don't bring sandals. Mark says, bring sandals. So what do we do with that, Holly? I don't know. Well, we have to think about (laughs) it. That's what we need to do. Okay. Matthew and Luke have plural nouns, staffs, or in Old King James, staves. (laughs) Mark has a singular noun, staff. So, you know, they're not the same word. It seems, actually, that Jesus was telling them to only take one staff, not more than one. So don't bring anything extra, because whatever you bring with you, that's going to be enough. Similarly, the Gospels do agree that he says don't bring an extra tunic. So it's the same idea. You you don't need to bring anything extra. Now, interestingly, most modern English translations have Matthew and Luke say staff, singular. So basically, they're incorporating a pure contradiction. They are saying Matthew and and Luke say, don't bring a staff. Mark says, bring a staff. Why? Well, that's because um, two early manuscripts of both Matthew and Luke, Codex Sinaiticus and Codex Vaticanus, they say staff and not staffs. Now, one gospel, we favor the majority text for reasons too complex to share here, but we made a whole video on it, didn't we, Holly? We did. If you want to learn more about why translations are different and why this matters, check out our video. Are all translations of the Bible the same? I'll give you a hint. They're not. Okay, so we kind of cleared that up, but what's the story on sandals? Is there an explanation for that? What do you think, Holly? I think there is. I think there's a decent chance. Otherwise, we might not be talking about it. Okay. Mark and Matthew use different Greek words. Mark uses sandalion. 
Matthew uses hoopadema. Something like that. I don't know. <laughs> In Bible dictionaries, they are both translated as sandals. So if you look up the words, there's like sandal. And in the Greek translation of the Hebrew scriptures, also called the Old Testament, um, by some, um, it correlates, both of these words, they correlate with the Hebrew word na'al, which means sandal in Hebrew. So, um, well, are they the same thing? Well, actually, the context of those two different Greek words I misspelled that. This is works. Words shows they are not exactly the same thing. So hoopedema sandals represent an expensive or a regal sandal. And we'll give you some examples. Go, Holly. Bring forth the best robe and put it on him and give a ring for his hand and sandals for the feet. That's from the parable of the uh, prodigal son. So the prodigal son comes home Dad's like, this is great. Give him the best robe. Give him the ring. Give him the, give him the hoopadema, <laughs> hoopadema sandal, sandals. But one who is mightier than I is coming after me, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and loosen or bear. He who is coming after me is preferred before me, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to loosen. Okay. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all have Jesus say, I am, not Jesus, John the Baptist say that he's not worthy to um, unstrap or bear the, um, the sandals of the coming Messiah. And so again, the coming Messiah was felt to be a king. And so um, these would be nice sandals. You know, do, you know, should the king wear the crappy sandals, Holly? What do you think? I don't think so. Nope. Okay. In the Septuagint, uh, hypodema or hoopadema sandals were the sandals that never wore out due to Yahweh's providence while the Israelites were in the wilderness for 40 years. And I have led you 40 years in the wilderness. Your clothes are not waxen old upon you. And thy shoe is not waxen old upon thy foot. I like how the King James uses shoe for sandal. Now, the context of that, when he said that nothing's going to wear out, the context of that is that the Israel, Israelites had acquired the fine things of Egypt before they left. So the sandals acquired from them presumably would be fine in quality. And the children of Israel did according to the word of Moses. And they borrowed of the Egyptians jewels of silver and jewels of gold and raiment. And the Lord gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians, so that they lent unto them such things as they required, and they spoiled the Egyptians. So if you spoil somebody, you, you, you take the good stuff. You with me on that? Yep. All right, cool. Now, Sandalion, now we're going to the other word. It seems to correlate with dressing down. So we've got two examples of that. And when the inhabitants of Gibeon heard what uh, Joshua had done unto Jericho and Ai, they did work wily and went and made as if they had been ambassadors and took old sacks upon their asses and wine bottles, old and rent and bound up, and old shoes and clouted upon their feet and old garments upon them and all the bread of their provision was dry and moldy. Hmm. So they had old garments, and they had old shoes. Again. And old bread. King James, they, they, they like to use the word shoe instead of sandal, but the word really is sandal. So they had old sandals, old garments, probably not the good stuff. What do you think? Yeah, and old bread. Yep, yep, dry and moldy. At the same time spake the Lord by Isaiah, the son of Amos, saying, Go and loose the sackcloth from off thine loins, and put off thy shoe from thy foot. And he did so, walking naked and barefoot. All right. Before we talk about the shoe again, so you know how a lot of Christians get all fired up about nudity? Yep. Just 
what 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 did what did God, you know, the creator of the universe, that guy, what did he tell Isaiah to do? Walk naked and barefoot. I know. It's wild, isn't it? Anywho, um so um again, if you're wearing sackcloth, that means you're you're mourning and you're just wearing uncomfortable crappy stuff. So the shoes Again, the sandals that you're taking off when you're wearing the sackcloth. Do you think those are the good sandals? Yeah, they're not the Sunday best. No. Okay, now, before you think I'm uh, completely um, overgeneralizing, I will say one thing. So, in the, um, in the book of Judith, which is a Greek book in the Septuagint and is not in the Protestant Bible, but is in the... Catholic Bible, they do actually kind of imply that Sandalian could be a nicer um, sandal in one um, one passage where, like, the, the Judith is, like, dressing up or whatever. However, it's also possible if a woman's wearing a sandal and she's, like, you know, gussying up, um, it could be that the sandal had less material, You know, it's like, you know, back in those days when they had modesty, you know, they were showing off their feet. (laughs) What do you think, Holly? Yeah, sexy feet. Is that a, uh, you think that's a plausible explanation? Possibly. Possibly. Okay. So, Jesus had taught the crowds, which included the apostles, not to worry about food or clothing. So now we're going back to, why was Jesus saying this in the first place? Because we're trying to make the case that he's telling them, don't wear good sandals, just wear ordinary ones. You cannot serve God in riches. Because of this I say to you, do not worry about your soul, what you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor for your body, what you should put on. Is the soul not more than food and the body more than clothing? Behold the fowls of the heaven, For they do not sow, nor reap, nor gather into the storehouses. But your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more valuable than they? Which of you by worrying can add 18 inches to his height? And why do you worry about clothing? Consider carefully the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither labor nor spin. I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. And if God clothes the grass of the field in this manner, which is here today and cast into the oven tomorrow, shall he not clothe you much more? O you of little faith, therefore do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we put on? For the nations seek for all of these things, for your heavenly Father knows that ye need all of these things. So, Jesus had probably said this within the last few months, and now he's sending out his apostles to live this out, to really not worry about whether they're going to be provided for, because God will. So this was part of their training, because Jesus knew that worse times were coming ahead for them after he would be gone. Jesus later reflects back to this time, shortly before his death saying he sent them without hoopedema sandals, among other things, and they lacked nothing. He said to them, When I sent you without money bag and leather sack and sandals, did you lack anything? They said nothing. Then he said to them, But now he who has a money bag, let him take it up, and in the same way a leather sack. And he who does not have a small sword... Let him sell his garment and buy one. So, okay, here we go again. I just, Jesus like keeps like throwing me off. Y- you know, like a lot of Christians are kind of like, they get a little nervous about, you know, like self-defense and firearms and stuff. Well, you, what, what do you just tell these apostles to do? Go out and get a sword. Get a sword. <laughs> Oh my gosh. A small sword. Okay. Now I'm going to I'm going to retract my shock and go back to the subject in hand. Now, um this is from the Gospel of Luke. 
And he says, I sent you out with sandals and you didn't lack anything, right? Again, Hoopadema sandals. Now, when we were talking about the differences in the passage we started with, we were talking about Matthew and Mark, right? Here you have in a totally different passage, much later, Luke and Matthew match. These are the same types of sandals that he sent them with. And, um, and not the fancy ones that he told them not to wear. So, um, that first passage that we started with, well, this is how one gospel's current translation looks. We added some black italics to help, um, to help bring out what seems to be the context. He commanded them that they should take nothing for the journey except one staff. Acquire neither gold, nor silver, nor copper in your money belts, nor leather sack, but wear simple sandals, and do not put on two tunics each, nor expensive sandals, nor take multiple staffs, nor bread, for the laborer is worthy of his food. What do you think, Holly? I think that's pretty cool. All right. Now, so what's the point of all this? Is this about sandals? Well, there's a couple things. Number one, intellectually, this illustrates the difficulty of combining the Gospels into one continuous narrative. It's probably why normal people don't embark on trying to do this. Um, You know, your your host is not normal. Um, And it, it also, though, shows one potential way of dealing with an apparent contradiction. You know, you look into the words and you actually try to figure out what's going on. Um, the last episode on Bethsaida, which some of you watched, um, showed another type of resolution because we looked at what looked like a contradiction about Bethsaida, like were they leaving Bethsaida or were they going to Bethsaida? And we actually looked at a lot of historical sources and came to the conclusion that, you know, there's actually no reason to think there weren't two Bethsaidas, one on the east and one on the west. Now, that's intellectually interesting, but I think there's a grander truth here that is worth looking at because spiritually, this investigation unlocks a truth that is only apparent when you combine the accounts, which I think is why we do one gospel in the first place. Holly, what, you with me? Yes. Okay, so the truth. God may send you out with the good stuff, like the Israelites, or not like the apostles. But either way, you'll get what you need. Thanks for listening.